Hello, and welcome to First Christian Church's Adult Fellowship Bible Study. We are having good discussions in our uh, live Sunday morning class uh, as we go through Hebrews, and I hope that continues. Uh, hopefully those of you who are tuned in virtually are finding uh, productive ways to discuss what you're learning in the lessons with others. Uh, today's lesson will focus on uh, chapter 2, the first nine verses uh, of, in Hebrews. And I'll read here those verses in the New Revised Standard Version. Again, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first to the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard him, while God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone is testified somewhere. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them. You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in in subjection to them but we do see jesus who for a little while was made lower than the angels now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of god he might taste death for everyone bible uh, additions show more variation than normal uh, in their the way they handle the divisions within this chapter and subtitle and so forth. Some do not divide it at all, uh, but leave it all as one chapter uninterrupted. Uh, some do divide it uh, in, in that uh, they pull the first four verses out and leave the rest of it together. And usually those first four verses are titled with something like uh, a warning or pay attention, uh, that sort of thing. A few divide it into three sections with verses uh, five through nine under a title related to the sun being incarnated lower than the angels for, for a time uh, to make a strong contrast with the angel story in chapter one. The first four verses are an interruption in the story flow from chapter one. Uh, most scholars say chapter one, chapter two are linked right together and probably wouldn't even be divided if it wasn't for those four verses uh, there. Which the subject is Christ or the son compared to angels was, was the issue in chapter one. Fred Craddock says the author is using classic preacher warnings here to interject uh, his his uh, topic that is this idea of pay attention this pause pay attention he is driving home Craddock says that the audience must get this message keep alert and keep all that is being said now and what was said in the past in one mindset I like the way Craddock says that in one mindset that's a lot of stuff Another says, this is not entertainment, folks, but an exercise in serious rhetoric that requires a concentrating mind, good memory, and careful analysis. 
the New Revised Standard Version helps some by using therefore, thus signaling that at least a, that there's a tie there, that something is coming and you need to tie things together. But the New Revised Standard Version seems to miss that point. Uh, they, they seem more focused on the speaker, including himself with his audience by using the word we. Dr. Fred Craddock adds also to note how this chapter is tightly woven together as we study it into a single message. The word attention is used only one other time in Hebrews. While it is often used in the New Testament, uh, Matthew is notorious for that. Uh, some scholars suggest Hebrews is just using it here more as a warning not to let what is being said uh, slip past them, but, to, but because of the seriousness of what he's going to be saying, but to stop and connect what you were taught in the past or what we believe in the past relative to the Hebrew scriptures and what the new understanding that this early faith of uh, Christianity has based on the teachings of Jesus. Others argue this is much more than just connecting the two chapters, but rather to connect the whole argument between accepting early Christianity's concepts and returning to the Jew or returning to the Jewish uh, faith. Warning, so they claim, is to remember and understand that what the Old Testament taught while assessing this new information. This warning occurs early on in Hebrews, and literary scholars teach that such was a Greek style uh, when the argument was uh, critical complex and detailed was that you gave this this warning very early on uh, you didn't wait till you got near the end to remind them it was an early warning also in greek raymond brown uh, taught that this author used lengthy and complex sentences in the greek while the english translations break this up into many small and concise sentences and he said, as a result, uh, there's a price you pay for that uh, when you break it up, in that the more complex meaning is lost. So much of it is lost. Much of the argument just does not come through in the English versions, Brown says. In verse 2, the reference to mediating angels is, is referring back to Mount Sinai and the, the, the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments, and so forth. Yet Exodus 20 gives no such idea. So where does this idea come from? This author uses it as if it is in the Old Testament. Israelites late, uh, later, as well as early Christians, had come to the point of belief that God did not deliver or address Moses directly, but dictated his message, mediated through angels to Moses. The same, they said, was true for the Torah is God's word uh, to Moses that was spoken to Moses through angels. That was a well-established concept in Judaism by 400 years before Christ, they say. And so this, this is what Christ would have understood, uh, uh, or Jesus would have understood, as, uh, and probably was taught. Some say that idea is not scriptural, but if you go to Acts 7, verses 37 and 38, you will see that Jesus himself taught just exactly that. To We also saw this uh, when we studied the Apocrypha material, that they all always uh, sent things through uh, to an angel. In other words, the uh, 
God's oracles, uh, which is often the way it's described in those Apocrypha books, is God's oracle. It was delivered to uh, the receiver by an angel. And so that was an understanding in Judaism four to five hundred years prior to Christ. And so it, it was, for lack of a better term, that was the dogma of the day. Thus Hebrew authors, the pre Hebrew author is just using this in context of the general understanding of the time and place. Thus there is not a need to explain it to his audience. They understood it as well. That was their understanding. It's us today who may have been taught differently, who have a very different understanding of that. So this was an assumed fact at the time of the Hebrews writing. This is especially a difficult situation for those who take scripture literally. As assumed at the time, the issue uh, in verse 3 is this. If the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law are God's law, then how shall we escape? For they cannot be kept. That's the assumption, scholars say, that the Hebrews writer is teaching here. Therefore, if we neglect and turn away from this new offer of salvation that's offered through the Son, we are lost. Hebrews author here is saying Jesus taught this too this is not just my idea as has been witnessed to us he says basically he's referred to by the disciples they heard him and attested to it such Craddock says that message had to have been a powerful attention getter for any face-to-face -face audience which is how Hebrews is thought to have been delivered for any, anyone, he says, that would have been riding the fence and wanting to either move to the older faith uh, and, and reject the new faith. He says, that seems to be buried in this warning and the, and the reason for the seriousness uh, of the warning uh, if you neglect it and miss the message of the new covenant. Moving on into verse 5 through 9, scholars say that is the Greek the author has clearly connected to what has preceded these words. Uh, he uses the Greek word gar. In other words, the Hebrew writer, uh, a word when you spell it in English uh, as it is in, in Greek would be G-A-R, which was a conjunction and is usually translated for or some other weak uh, English conjunction. However, many translators, like the New, new uh, International Version, totally drops the conjunction connection, and even the New Revised Standard waters it down to now, which is being used in the, now is being used in the form of a conjunction rather than an adverb here. What follows is the quotation from Psalms 8. The author of Hebrews wants to make sure and make clear that this connection between chapter 1 uh, and this quotation are linked. And some of the translations just don't do that, it, uh, the scholars say. The author sees these psalm texts as prophecy. That's how he's teaching it, says Dr. Harold Atridge at Yale University. In the eschatological age to come, there will be messianic rule that that is the belief and that that messiah is the son angels have governed in the present age is the implied understanding and the son was placed in a state below the angels while he was here on earth that's the message that's being taught here dr atridge says dr harold hagner of Fuller Theological teaches that it is important to make the connection that the pre-existing Son of God was lower to and in, and in an inferior position to the angels while he was here, and that such is indispensable 
to God's purpose of redemption in the theology that the Son was God. That is, this idea that previously the Son was God, the Son had to become a human in order to die. Gods don't die in the Hebrew tradition, that concept. So, in order to die, he had to be made lower than the angels. But following death, he was resurrected and restored to this to his exalted position. In the coming world or age, that son will be appointed heir to all things by God the Father. Hebrews here implies that son prophesied that. That's Dr. Hagner's teaching now. The son of man concept is that humanity uh, the, the humanity concept if you will. That is that it's prophesied that the Son of Man in the Old Testament, several places, is that the figure that becomes humanity. That's Hagner's connection here. He's saying the Son of Man that's in Isaiah and some other places in the Old Testament is humanity. In other words, the Son of Man takes on humanity. That Son of Man is understood to be Jesus as we see in the Gospel of Mark. We call those of us who have been studying this for a long time now, we've studied Mark in detail, and the take-home message there was that the suffering servant, son of man, qualify. Uh, the author of Hebrews is basically it, on this same page as Mark. However, at this time, everything is not yet subject to the son. That comes in the next age. Thus Hebrews is holding the idea that Jesus was fully humanized while he was here on earth as a Messiah, which makes possible human salvation through his death. Without that humanizing of the pre-existing uh, God persona, he says, there would be no hope for mankind if you turn away. God has done this for mankind. It's basically Hebrews teaching. What Hebrews wants his audience, the Hebrew author wants his audience to understand is that at the outset that this is what's going to be being taught and he will provide further defense as he goes through. Dr. Peter O'Brien, the Anglican scholar uh, uh, who's best known for his Hebrews work, it, uh, in commentary, it stresses that these nine verses are a warning for the audience not to reject the word, if you will, of John's gospel, or the word of prophecy in the Old Testament, and those of Jesus while he was here on earth. This is his first warning passage, he says, that, that is the Hebrews warnings, first passage, and by its placement in early Greek rhetoric of the time, the most significant. Thus the Son's message demands more serious attention. Jesus is subject to, is the subject of the two passive verbs that are in verse 8 there. Jesus' suffering and death was a necessary prelude to the glorification uh, back to God and is the root of our salvation. That's Dr. O'Brien's summary of this. I hope this is of some help uh, as you study this, and hopefully we'll continue on next week with the rest of chapter 2.